on this episode of Edge of the Web. Whatever the means is, is up to you, and there's plenty of articles to find there. But the, the underpinning, the first principle, if you will, is get them to the end. If you do that, you'll create a better show than your peers. Your weekly digital marketing trends with industry trend-setting guests. You're listening and watching Edge of the Web. Winners of Best Podcast from the Content Marketing Institute for 2017. Here at see more at edgeofthewebradio.com. Now, alongside Tom Broadbeck, here's your host, Aaron Sparks. All right, hey, uh, we're broadcasting from Edge Media Studios located in downtown Indianapolis, Indiana. Every week we bring you the, the latest trends in digital marketing as well as uh, top-notch international marketing influencers. You can check out all of our recent shows at edgeofthewebradio.com. Uh, we're powered by Site Strategics, uh, your digital marketing pioneer specializing in the agile marketing strategy and execution. If you want to learn more about what we do in our shop, uh, go over to Site Strategics. Strategics, S-I-T-E, strategics.com, and check out, inquire, and we'll, we'll sit down and have a, a free hour uh, consultation with you, uh, remote or in the studio or in the office here, uh, about what we do uh, on the digital marketing front. Um, I'm your host, Aaron Sparks. I'm the CEO of Site Strategics as well as Edge Media Studios. Uh, the reason w- we do this show is to to regularly bring education uh, to uh, potential to potential listeners uh, and different people inside of uh, just practicing digital marketing and execution. But on top of that, we really want to make sure that we are demystifying uh, the, the 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 concepts of digital marketing when it comes to search engine optimization or, so, or social media management and marketing, uh, conversion rate optimization, video marketing and video optimization, all these things. There's so many different channels, but you need to be that T marketer that we talk about regularly as you need to not only know your specialty, but also how it interacts with all the other disciplines inside digital marketing. That's what this show is all about. Uh, to my left, we have Thomas Broadbeck, Director of Digital Media. Hey, Aaron. How are you, you doing? Got it right this time. I appreciate did. that. I did. And one time out of 20. Yeah, no, so glad to be here. Love being here. Love being here every week, but I'm more excited for tomorrow, Aaron, because you know what's tomorrow? What is tomorrow? I'm seeing Billy Joel in concert. Really? He's here in Indianapolis. Try to get him on the oh, show. Oh, that's right. I remember you bought those tickets a long I time ago. I bought them a long time ago. Try to get him on the show, but... You know, we have we have Jay with us today. We're we're not his downtown girl. <laughs> it's uptown girl. Oh, see, <laughs> that's why that's why I'm not seeing Billy Joel. But Jay uh, Kunzo is here, keynote speaker and host of the podcast Unthinkable. Sir, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Why did you got to set the bar way up here with Billy Joel? I... <laughs> So Hold it's not Billy here, Joe. Folks. Billy Joel is Jay. Uh, so there's <laughs> no. That. We're glad to have to have you on the show, Jay. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad to be here. Hey, we certainly want to uh, promote the live stream to our live stream audience on Facebook. So if you uh, if you uh, can uh, jump into the stream because we're certainly asking questions of our audience, uh, and uh, we certainly want you to ask questions of of our guest and uh, and just have an authentic communication and conversation here during the broadcast so we're monitoring the channel and uh, you tee up a couple good uh, good uh, curveballs to Jay and we'll certainly deliver it to him um, you want to check out all the fav- all of our uh, audio platforms uh, you can find our podcast on iTunes Google Play uh, Stitcher iHeartRadio TuneIn Player FM SoundCloud Acast anything else that I'm missing you got them all. You Spreaker. Named... Yes, Spreaker. Yes. <laughs> I thought you said Podbean for a second. So we're not on Podbean anymore. No, we, we moved away from Podbean. And you can ask me why later. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, well, uh, before we get started with Jay, we want to wanted to bring Jay into our new sec- se- segment that we do with all of our guests. So uh, let's take you through the latest digital marketing news. I was very excited to start my reportings. This week's trending topics. All right. So from Ginny Marvin over at Search Engine Land, Google Home Services Ads uh, program rebrands expanding to 30 different cities by the end of 2017. Tom, what's this article all about? What's, Ginny's always good for a good, a good she is, insight. Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about this on the show uh, for a couple of weeks. So it's been a couple of weeks, but we've talked about it uh, several times. But Google is starting to control the appointment setting yep. within within Google. And so um, if we pull up the article here, Jim, 
Uh, if you scroll down here, it kind of shows, it has a screenshot here of what it kind of looks like on the back end side of things. And if you scroll further down, um, it kind of shows the how on the mobile maps. And it's kind of, re- it doesn't really talk about it in the article, but it's showing that um, the these new uh, service ad, they're calling them local service. Uh, let me find it again. Mm-hmm. Local services by Google. And uh, these are kind of, it looks like they're replacing the, the maps. So if you were to search Atlanta plumber, mm-hmm. you're not going to be hit with, uh, with a map. You're going to be hit with these, with these ads to book or call your own local plumber through Google. And they've got a lead inbox. They and do have a lead inbox that you can control through uh, their local services app that's on iOS and Android. Um, you control the number of leads they receive through the program by pausing or enabling the ads. Uh, a little bit further down, talks about the pricing that Google sets the pricing for the appointment, <laughs> which I thought was kind of interesting. Oh, oh, oh no, you didn't. <laughs> Are yeah. you serious? Yeah. Advertisers set a weekly budget, but Google, um, uh, instead of the typical bidding auction, leads are are priced by Google for each job type in each area. Businesses can see the price of a lead when they sign up uh, in the app. Uh, there's a quote from the director of for small and medium businesses ads, Kim Spalding. She said in the phone ah, interview okay. Monday. So it's the price of the lead, not the price of the service that they're offering. Correct. Got yes. it. Got, Got it. it. So balancing what we know about the cost of jobs and the overall demand, advertisers set a weekly budget determined hmm. by the number of leads they want to receive. Google won't specifically say what factors go into the rankings in the ad unit. Right. But Spalding said there's a focus on quality, ratings, reviews, and the ability to connect right away, location, and a number of other different factors. So right now, cities, uh, there are 17 cities. He said expanding to 30, mm-hmm. but they didn't say which which 30 we're going to be expanded to. But right now, it's Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Dallas, Detroit, Miami, New York, Philly, Phoenix, Seattle, D.C., and then L.A., Riverside, California, Sacramento, San Diego, and San Francisco, and San Jose. So, um, again, that's what we were talking about for the longest time. Is Google getting in this in in front of the website, in front of the conversion? Correct. This is absolutely the space that they've been they've been uh, coveting for such a long time, and they built such a, a uh, user centric um, uh, in, environment with uh, mashup content based on your local, based on your preferences, based on your search your your search history. Now they're moving that uh, local space to be able to. Uh, convey leads to you and I mean that's it's their it's their audience it's their con- consumer yeah but boy that that scares the bejesus out of me <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to, to be honest with you Jay what do you think about that I, a lot of the moves that Google makes I, really any innovative company you can kind of extrapolate out from what they're doing now so I always go back to the same explanation of, of innovation which is uh, removing steps I think this comes from Ev Williams the founder of, of medium and, and Twitter before that and blogger before that mm-hmm. so Ev knows a thing or two about digital tech and innovation and and in an interview a few years ago he talked about you know this is a buzzword what the hell does it mean and he says it's just removing steps mm-hmm. so if you line up all the things that a user goes through and Google is a user first company not a not a business first company um, they care more about the end user than the advertiser they always have uh, that's where I started my career we were always user first and uh, if you line up all the steps somebody's going through using one of their services you can just tack on the next step and Google's going to come up with something or you can look at the three or four steps that are painful and Google's going to insert something so if you look at their evolution from the very beginning, they were they were the ones that you you basically had to ask a question, then they gave you the collection of information, you had to sort the information, and they gave you the answer. Those right. were the four steps of the Q&A process, the search process. And over time, their search innovation became removing some of those steps. So you had to ask the question. They organized the information. And by the way, they now surface the answers, right? Mm-hmm. And now they're actually predicting, or they have been for many years now, what your next question might be, right? Like they, they constantly look at what's already happening, what the behavior flow is of users, and they add something to keep you going, to keep you around. Right. Um, and the more they tie that back to uh, pay-per-click, the more money they make. So whether it's self-driving cars or something like this that seems incremental over a service they always offer, mm-hmm. it's always back to the steps a consumer is taking as it relates to their mission, which is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible for all. So, it, you know, we can debate it. It's good. It's bad. It's predictable. <laughs> it's predictable. Yeah. But it, it's, it, you know, I'll, I'll speak for the, uh, the businesses in the space is that it's getting into my sandbox is that I need to, I intended to control conversions on, on my web, on my web space or in all the different areas that I message. And that, that it's not a block. It is from an ad space, but just 
being in that space to control the lead flow and get between me and my consumer. I mean, they're already doing it in so many different useful ways, but but that, that transaction, that conversion is now, I mean, and on top of that, we saw two, about a year and a half ago, they started to experiment with the actual lead acquisition, not just a call, but it was also getting a quote. So those tools are, uh, they're still going to, they, they're not here yet, but they're going to be there. And at that point in time, Google's controlling a lot of the, 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 the conversion that's happening. And boy, that, that you know, as, as useful as it is, it's also um, uh, from, from, a, from a conservation standpoint, I really want to be able to control that on my own web property. Yeah. But maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, I would say that a lot of the businesses that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm generalizing here, but a lot sure. of the businesses that will benefit from this are not going to be the ones that have massive digital operations sure. and they, they could benefit from a smoother, frictionless process to convert a lead. You know, I, I think about a lot of the small businesses that they don't have, uh, you know, three or four people on their marketing team. They may right. not have any marketers. Right. Uh, they might not have an understanding of what their sort of conversion funnel looks like. So I think, yeah, if you're a savvier marketer, you should also be savvy enough to realize that when you play on an away territory, an away stadium like Facebook or Google, you play by their rules. It's not your home turf. You got to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. But if you're a small business, if you're someone who's actually like, look, every lead matters a larger percent to me than it right. does for a large organization. I think you'd be happy because it removes some of the friction it takes from, you know, it's like you think like a product manager, every request you make of a user, you get some attrition. Right. And so if I can remove the steps it takes, I can, I can have a straighter funnel. I can get more conversions more quickly. So I understand what you're saying. There are, there are some things to kind of proceed cautiously with, mm -hmm. but, but if I'm that small business, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, great. Like, I'm going to lose fewer people. Just tell me resistance is futile and we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> Our corporate overlords are here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Speaking of corporate overlords, uh, Matt Southern over at Search Engine Journal uh, talks about Instagram letting users add a friend to live broadcast. That was no segue whatsoever to that Did article. you call Matt? Uh, and overlord. Corporate, uh, and corporate. Overlord. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. Um, so Instagram has actually inst introduced the ability to add another person to your live videos, making it possible for two accounts to broadcast together at the same time. Um, you know, while broadcasting a live video, uh, there can there will be a new icon at the bottom of the screen, which you can tap to invite someone to someone else to join the live video. Rather than letting users invite any of their uh, any of their connections to join the broadcast. Instagram will only let users invite people who are currently watching. Of course, uh, it's, uh, there's, if there's a specific person that you want to give uh, the go, go live with, you can always coordinate it through your messaging platform of your choice. So, so you can broadcast together. Yeah, and then I assume it will appear on both both people's feeds. So if we did a joint Instagram uh, podcast with mm -hmm. Jay, mm -hmm. we have both had. Uh, I uh, haven't checked our Instagram following in a while, but if we both had huge followings, I assume we'd both show up on both of our feeds and right. we can double, you know, Ooh. our reach. No, we can. Or we, borrow each other's reach, I should say, for that broadcast. I dig that. So, yeah, it could be it could be an interesting tool, you know. It's vertical video, though, Aaron. I don't know. No! <laughs> Have you seen that PSA, Jay? <laughs> Uh, I've, are you referring the, to your rant against the whole video? video? Yes. Yes. I, I have. Yeah. <laughs> How are you feeling? Are you okay? <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm triggered. I really am. <laughs> that is like the bane of my existence. Just tilt, tilt the screen. That's all you got to do. Yep. Users are lazy. We just talked about <laughs> removing friction from a process, right? It's yep. people are looking for the even the most tiny little incremental removal of friction matters, right? Yep. So if I'm doing this because I'm holding the phone already, that's more likely than than asking someone to do this. Plus, they don't have the taste that you have, man. You know. Come on. <laughs> wow, way to stroke the host there. I'm just thinking everybody's lazy. We might as well just do digital marketing from our couches, right? <laughs> Let's reduce all the friction possible. We are living through a shortcut culture era. <laughs> 
All right. So uh, for Marketing Line, last last article from uh, additionally Matt Southern, uh, Facebook's dynamic creative can generate up to 6,250 versions of an ad. Here comes programmatic uh, rolling out here. So, Tom, take it away. What's going on here? Uh, so a new ad format, or not ad format, a new tool that you can use to format a bunch of different ads. Mm -hmm. Facebook's calling it uh, the dynamic creative tool, which will enable brands to input multiple options for mm -hmm. each of the mm -hmm. elements that make up an ad, photo, headline, call to action, etc. cetera. Uh, it's available through Facebook Ads Manager and Power Editor. And so they gave a quick example of what could happen here. Once an advertiser clicks on the dynamic creative option, they can add up to 30 assets, five titles or headlines, 10 images or videos, five text entries, and that will uh, serve as the ad's caption, five descriptions of an ad link, or five videos or calls to actions. And it permutates uh, and it everything. Will create a variety of different ads that won't show all 6,000 ads if you upload the max for each section. But uh, it'll it it will use its uh, machine learning or its um, uh, its technology to better best serve you yep. to the user. What do you think about that, Jay? <laughs> Six thousand. As a creative, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. If you're asking a creative. So we had a technology like this. It, I'm sure it still exists. I haven't touched AdWords through Google in a long time. But when I was on the AdWords team there, we had this program that would generate multiple types of ads. Mm -hmm. And we had a human element for the higher spend accounts as well that would start you off. And so I saw that interplay unfold at Google through search ads. I think it's the same thing. It's if you think mm -hmm. of a creative, you know, you need both the math and, and the heart. You need the creative and you need the, the statistics and the data-minded people. And I think the way I would look at it is like coloring in a circle. If a, if a great ad is fully colored in, I think a creative, the human element, sketches through most of that circle, right? Mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. is filling in the lines around the edges. Mm -hmm. And you, you need both. Um, but I think now you have, uh, you know, why would a creative spend time running to the right when they should be running left? This can tell you you should run left. Great. Pointing your people and your sort of human capital, I hate that phrase, <laughs> in, in, in the right direction, I think is important. Yep. The problem is when this stuff is early, you get a lot of tone deafness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what happened at Google where it was like, you know, dynamic keyword insertion into headlines and all that stuff. It, it, it made a lot of brands look really, really bad. It really so I did, would say yeah. proceed cautiously. Uh, I, uh, uh, now, there's no laziness reference there uh, for the creatives to just go ahead and not color in everything. Some people will color, the, color all their ads in for them. You're not saying that, are you? No, well, I mean, it, it, here's here's what I would say. You know, if you're a football fan and yep. there's a uh, you know fourth and goal situation, or let me better example, if if it's a first and goal situation, you don't know what's coming. Maybe you pass it, maybe you run it. If it's third and goal, you're like, eh, they're probably going to try to punch it in there. It's third and short. All right, like there's there's that brute, brute forcing of it because you're like this close, right? Yep. But what got you this close? was a lot of messiness. It was a lot of like, you know, trying to play the game and understand the empathy of who you're playing against or with. And, you know, there's a lot more moves you can make. So I think a, a good creator um, gets you this close and then the optimization gets you the rest of the way there. And so for that reason, I think they need, you need both. Um, but I think we're, we're so proud of the ability to optimize and we're so proud of the tech. And it sounds <laughs> so cutting edge to say you use something like this that we over-optimize for it. So don't lose sight of the fact that you do need that creative element. You know, I should, I'll start with broad strokes going mm -hmm. this way. I'll gain massive yards. I'll get step function growth, right? If I have a good team, it's always the team, right? It's never the tools, it's the team first. And then that little extra bit to just punch it in there, that's the technology. Well said, but I didn't get the sports reference. Can you use a <laughs> Star Wars analogy as, a, as opposed to football? No, but I'll use a cooking reference if it makes okay. sense. Because if you can't tell, I'm Italian, right? And, you know, so uh, it's you know you could have all the equipment in the kitchen, you could have all the right ingredients, you could have the recipe in front of you, but I, I think that's just that's incremental, right? Yeah, that's yeah. it's it's also table stakes because everyone has access to that same stuff. The chef and the cooks and the people and your understanding of who you're serving. Yep, that's everything. Beautiful. Well said. Well said. See, I got that one. Always related to food for Aaron. <laughs> Absolutely. And if, me. You, if you can bring steaks into it, that's right. although that's what, not what he was really referencing. But I heard because steak. That's what, when you think of the, the chef, he's cooking you yeah. a steak. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right, good. I'm, I'm, I'm solid with that. Um, it, no, there, it's, it's guide points. It's, it's um, the way to be able to test that, that, that creativity as well and get, and get value because part of the creative mindset is 
they won't explore all the options because that's the that's the left brain side of things. So you have to have that feedback loop to be able to make decisions and and, and find what the consumers are really engaging with. So right. it's absolutely a recon tool as well. So we're going to see that that's already deployed. We're going to see how valuable that is uh, from the Facebook side of things. Excellent. I'll tell you what else also is valuable. It's our newsletter. On a regular basis, you should be signing up to uh, the Edge of the Web radio newsletter. So go over to, you can even text to the number 22828, the word Edge Talk, right there at the screen. And you can actually jump into our sign-up process. We promise we will not use this for any other solicitation except sending you wonderful, beautiful nuggets of digital gold uh, in, a, in the form of news stories, a synopsis of uh, who we've interviewed, who we're going to be interviewing, and maybe a pro tip or two. So check that out, and uh, you can do, certainly go over to Edge of the Web radio dot com and sign up right there and you know what give us some feedback on the show while you're at it right that's right all right so follow all the featured trending topics over at edge of the web radio.com now let's deep dive with this week's featured guest now it's time for edge of the web featured interview with keynote speaker and host of the unthinkable podcast jay akunzo so jay you got the deep voice guy right there giving you an intro how about that as a podcaster, oh my gosh, I am so jealous of that guy's pipes. Wow. <laughs> He's awesome. I mean, he does movie trailers too, so it's fantastic. Well, for our, our listeners and our and our live streamers, um, let's introduce Jay here. We've got Jay. He's an award-winning podcaster, a dynamic keynote speaker as well, and a veteran digital and content marketer. He, he was also a digital media strategist at Google and the head of content of, for multiple startups, including HubSpot. Yay, HubSpot. We love HubSpot. Uh, Jay's also the host of the Unthinkable podcast, which explores examples of work that may seem crazy until you hear their side of the story. It's an incredible uh, podcast, very, very entertaining and uh, great narrative uh, uh, audio. So we we certainly wanted to reach out and connect with Jay because he's he's, he's truly leading in uh, the podcast uh, medium. So thanks for dro dropping on. Thanks so much. You, you left something important out of my bio, though, which uh -oh. is that I have a beagle puppy and I work from home. So at some point, he's going to make a cameo just, you know, verbally <laughs> and be able to hear him. So. Yeah, I was, we, we I was told my wife I wanted a beagle, but we ended up with the lab instead instead of the, mm. the beagle. So are you you is this your first beagle or it's it's my first beagle? Yeah. 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 He's a mix. But the thing that is purebred beagle is right, right here. There, the, mm -hmm. Oh, boy. Yeah, <laughs> that'll do it to you. Beagles oh, are yeah. awesome. Beagles are awesome. We actually have a uh, a uh, uh, a golden uh, retriever, and we also have a, uh, uh, a not a labradoodle. Is it labradoodle? It's a yeah. No, no, mini no. doodle. No, no, it's a labradoodle. Okay. And uh, it's, it looks like a wookie. It, it truly does. And <laughs> she's got such an attitude. She'll she'll come to the door, wait for you to get there, and then basically flip you off and will go away. <laughs> Three times. It's a cycle. Three times she does that. Pissing me off. I love it. What viewers don't realize is we've moved to a new segment called Edge of the Dog now. <laughs> <laughs> I'll push her off the edge. I'll tell you that. Well, Jay, <laughs> thank you for that. I, I needed a, I needed a gripe publicly on that one. Hey, uh, Jay, give us your backstory. What's your history about? Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to be a sports journalist, and the thing that always fascinated me most was that you could create things. And for me, early on, it was writing. It's moved to speaking and podcasting, too. Mm -hmm. You could create something that makes other people feel. You know, how cool is that? I feel something when I'm writing this joke or telling it on stage or creating this story or whatever, and I can trigger that same response from other people. And from a young age, I was really fascinated in, with that. And it turns out there's a corporate use for that. So, uh, you know, I always say I, I showed up to work because they told me I could write. And just one thing led to another. And now, um, you know, I make a living creating what I call concept based entertainment forward B2B shows. You know, I think that we just derive so much meaning in our work. And the way most B2B content marketing or most media about the workforce portrays work is bland, mm. it's just boring. It doesn't hold my attention at all. And it doesn't explore it with that joy whether it's uh, because I'm so excited about what's new and next and or, or that kind of like humor or even a, a certain sappiness and emotion to it. So I set out a few years ago to create first podcasts 
that make you feel something about the work that you do. And, and the first one is unthinkable. And we're exploring people that, yeah, like you said, from the outside, the stories look insane. I can't believe they did it that way or did that thing. And then you tell their story and it turns out it's, it's actually not so unthinkable after all. Uh, it, 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 that's a fantastic picture of kind of framing up uh, unforgettable, uh, unthinkable. Sorry, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I've already forgotten it. No, unthinkable. <laughs> um, you've for our listeners and our audience, you must go check it out because it it, it is is beyond storytelling. And I and you are in a new space uh, which is just defining itself right now. And it's these the the interstitial use uh, the, the the digital imagery to take you on that on that audio narrative right and it 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 takes little pit stops in into explore somebody's story along the way so it's not just from one vantage point you're actually kind of sharing multiple vantage points as you're going through that and from a, from an empathy standpoint and from a connection standpoint the users that are experiencing that the listeners that are experiencing that um will they are actually given more dimension to just understanding a topic than your authority and your exploration. You're really kind of showcasing and giving a stage to all of these different influencers and players that you're talking talking about. Yeah, I appreciate that. I love that description. Um, I think for me that we're living through this era where everything is trying to be neatly packaged into a how-to or a tips and tricks list. Mm. Um, you know, there's there's more experts coming out of the woodwork telling you you have to do things a certain way. No, you don't. The only thing you have to do is is really like, well, first of all, be kind. And second of all, do what's right in your own situation, right? Embrace right. your context first. And if the expert's best practice helps you, maybe to some percent, great. Um, and so that's what we talk to. We talk to people or businesses. We find stories where they're obsessed with the stuff in their own context. First comes themselves and their own self-awareness and their teams. Then comes their audience or customer, whoever they're serving. Hmm. And then comes their own kind of, you know, their resources, their ability to make the work happen. Um, you know, and, and, and that's a messy thing to explore your context. Reality is messy, right? But I think that's where you find the actual best practice or the actual right way forward, the actual answer. It's not some neatly packaged tip or trick or cheat or hack, you know, mm. it's all that stuff leads to average work, it leads to commodity thinking and copycat mm -hmm. work. You know, I think the best in our business right now are really interested in what's right around them. They're pulling out their answers from within. And there's a word for that. It's your intuition. Yeah. So really at its core, we're exploring how to trust your intuition, how to move that from these like ghost-like ideas to a practical tool. And uh, yeah, like you said, we explore, we don't have guests, we tell stories. So we, we explore a story from all angles. It gets really messy. We find an idea, then we try to just totally ruin it and mess with it. If, you, if it gets too simple in our minds, we got to go deeper. So uh, for me, that, you know, that's what brings meaning to my life and my show is, you know, I want to create something that mir mirrors reality more so than a, a neat little tip and trick article. Yeah. Um, but then I'm finding that overlap between stuff I like and others like too. And, and luckily the show is, uh, is taken off. Um, something else, another observation I had of just listening to your, your podcast is that, um, like I said, there's, there's a new appreciation for that person's story, but it's, it's, it, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing is the, there's this new medium that we're utilizing this, the, the, the audio imagery that that is no longer in the and no offense meant the entertainment industry because you don't come from the entertainment industry you're finding a platform and we've uh, we've adopted this new this new medium and uh, it's so so much more easier to actually paint with with audio imagery uh, we're going to be taking a lot away from what was the, the the conventional entertainment industry and this fractionalized type of consumer that we that we all are are appealing to. We are now able to not have to to uh, um, just use standard conventions to to uh, get the point across. Now we can explore exactly how we want to paint the picture, but on top of that, the consumer can give feedback of exactly how much they enjoy engaging with those non-conventional ways of storytelling. I thought it was a securitist route getting here. <laughs> but uh, you see what I'm saying is that we are now in the, in the realm and the era of the non-conventional new media audience engagement, and you're typifying that with how you're – I mean, we were talking before before the show – 
you t- it takes a long time for you to put that together, doesn't it? Each and every it show. It does, yeah. You know, the, the stories are about 30 to 35 minutes long. Yep. There's a lot of narration. There's a lot of post-production, music, sound effects, you name it. And we're cropping out the quotes and rearranging them, all that. Um, it does take a while. It's it's something I love doing. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know, you can, you can put a framework to it. You can get better at it. But the thing I, I want to uh, dive into that you just mentioned, mm-hmm. which is, you know, all these new experimental ways that people in the business world are creating media in, you know, organizations, whether you have a product or a service um, that borrow from entertainment media, it always comes back to, and I think everybody would embrace that the the kind of carbon atom of our work, if you will, is attention. Yep. Like you don't exist unless you have your customer, your audience, whoever's attention. Now, the problem is I think our understanding has stopped there. We're like, I get it, attention. And so how does one get attention? If all I say to you is you need attention, People start waving their arms frantically. They try to jump out in front of you. They try to yell things that are more sensational or louder. And so you get a lot of bad actors. You get mm. a lot of like brute force, blunt instrument approaches to content. Yep. I want to know why. Why is attention important? And more importantly, what do I do with it? And I think we're living through this huge shift where marketers purview used to be acquire attention, mm. right? In one moment in time or several moments in time that are disconnected to get in front of you enough times that you're going to buy. Um, acquire attention was the name of the game. Today, the consumer has all the power. Today, people only choose what brings them extreme value. And they're going to invest a precious resource that's under attack, which is time. Mm -hmm. So how do you get that attention, that time? Um, You can't just acquire it. You have to hold it. And that's the shift. You have to get better at holding attention. And it turns out there are human beings in this world and organizations and industries and, and frameworks and skills. Just there's a lot of stuff beyond the business world, yep. beyond the world of tech and entrepreneurship and marketing, that they know how to hold your attention, right? It's the stuff we consume all the time. And oh, by the way, that great stuff, that entertainment media, that's now on the same channels as the stuff that we're publishing, right? Because right. above or below this Facebook Live thing is going to be your friend's post, is going to be you know a clip from a show you wanted to watch, is going to be a news article or an entertainment piece. So you got to level up. Yeah. You can't just jump out in front of people or go along for the ride of the actual great inter- entertainment media. You have to be entertaining. You have to be gripping. And I don't mean shtick. I mean worthy of spending more time with. Amen. You got to get them to the end, right? So that's the shift. How do you go from acquiring attention to holding it? To me, you create great shows. Well, it's very similar in parity to what what you're talking about from from content marketing, all those those basic form list exercises. Now you have to actually do what marketers are supposed to do. You're supposed to work hard to be able to bring good content that's worthy of someone's time, right? There's so we we've, we've we move and this is not I mean, this is across all media, is that the user is now understanding what value they have. The consumer now realizes that their their time spent will mean potential conversion, potential lead, potential potential sales for whomever's broadcasting, who whomever is is providing you that content. It's not about the it's not about the clickbait anymore. It's about the deep dive. I, yeah. I believe we're starting, you know, the short swallows and the in the long, the long. What was that from Goodwill Hunting uh, or something like that? Uh, whenever you know, you've got the deep divers that go down and almost, uh, almost, uh, almost die. The swallows. You know what I'm talking about? Do you have any idea? I know, but you just referenced uh, a Ben Affleck movie. And no, was... no, no. I did. <laughs> I I did, didn't I? It's all right. Damn it. Matt Damon's a part of it too. Uh, <laughs> I think Matt Damon was the main scriptwriter for that sh- for that movie. Yeah. Ben Affleck was a part of it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to everybody. I, 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 <laughs> Jay, he, he's a Batman fan. He doesn't like that uh, Ben Affleck is uh, Batman. That was a sorry. wrong turn for DC. <laughs> I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's got three movies coming out. Got to love that. Anyway, the, the point is, is that um, that that time element is absolutely a maturing uh, effect for content writers, for marketers, and and practitioners such as yourself. You've got to be not just entertaining. You have to have that 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 oasis where people want to go and and actually right. explore what the narrative is. Right. Right. You can and you can tie a lot of what's happening and a lot of the things we're talking about that are symptom level to that you know diagnosis at the root of it, which is holding mm-hmm. attention. So you look at. Um, Facebook Live, you look at uh, Facebook video in general, video in general on social, you look at these micro moments that expire through Instagram stories and Snapchat. Why is Snapchat or why is Instagram adding a second person into the live feed? It all comes back to the fact that all 
all these technological visionaries, they're not seeing in the future, they're seeing what's happening right now, which is, they're seeing clearly, which is that it's getting harder to hold people's attention. And so you have two options. You can be that one that just spams the world and you get the people on LinkedIn posting their little pithy soliloquies about their realization in their life that leads to no substance <laughs> at all, right? All that stuff, those trends that, that the bad actors commit, that's, that's like you make a living having to find the next one constantly. Right. But if you understand how to tell a great story and the actual mechanics for doing so, if you understand how to root out answers and ideas from your customer's reality, if you understand yourself, your own DNA, um, you know, if you understand that, for example, your customer is busy versus, you know, they're, they have plenty of time on their hands, whatever, if you have insights, not just data, mm. you know, all of a sudden you can earn a living and that skill persists. Like a storyteller will always have a place because storytellers are great at the thing that most of us in organizations suck at, which is holding people's attention. There it is. You know, even the way that I've been speaking to you right now, I'm trying to come to like a final punch. Cause I know I want someone to continue to watch this show and see what's next. Right. So even to the inflection of my voice as a podcaster, and you guys know as a show host, everything you do can be oriented around this idea that I have to hold people's attention. It's strategic. Yep. It's not this lofty ideal. You know, it's good for business. And it's authentic and it's, and, it, and it's, and it's real. And say, and, and, and what we're realizing is, again, analogous to most of digital marketing, it's gotten gone from the, the, the wash and rinse, rinse, repeat uh, shallow and tepid content to much more thoughtful, much more uh, intentional and engaging content. And that's great because that means the consumer is more savvy and that they can connect with that authentic evangelist regardless of whatever, who, whatever, whatever brand they're representing. That's right. Very that's cool. right. It, when, when the wave crashes in any trend, the people that are left are the ones that do it well with integrity, right? And we're experiencing that now. The wave's coming out on a lot of people who are the hucksters, and I think the people that are left actually serve their audience well. I dig it. Um, let's dive into uh, 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 the the uh, the podcast. What's your favorite story or moment from your show that you'd like to share? Oh man, I have. I, I feel like I, I have like sixty five children. You're asking me to pick them on now. So, Pick your favorite uh, one. Kill the rest. That's so that's so tricky. Okay, so. <laughs> So my I have uh, my favorites are the, in the season coming up that I'm releasing at the end of November. So uh, teaser, way to right? way to like, intrigue, way to intrig favorites. <laughs> yeah, they're coming out. Uh, I'll look back though. My my favorite story we told is about uh, a coffee company called Death Wish Coffee. You guys know Death Wish? Yes, we do. Yes, I do. Okay, you don't. So, he, he doesn't uh, drink coffee. I don't yeah, drink so, coffee, so, but I saw your your presentation, the keynote that you did this year. Oh, thanks, uh, yeah. thanks. Um, I got some for a Christmas present. Continue. Yeah, that's great. So, the <laughs> Death Wish labels itself as the world's strongest coffee. Can mm -hmm. you attest? Yes, you I can. It, right? it, it is awesome. Oh my gosh, you'd be vibrating across the, the <laughs> desk right there. It, clear, it, it clears the pipes. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Um, so there's this guy, Mike Brown, who was in upstate New York trying to start a coffee business. It was his attempt to kind of salvage his career. He was very unhappy working in accounting before that. And this coffee business was going terribly. Like he had to sell all of his stuff. He had to sell his car and his house. He had to move back in with his parents. It was terrible. Um, all the experts he spoke to pointed to the same conventional thinking, the same best practice, which was Mike is roasting basically the wrong bean for coffee. There's two beans, Robusta and Arabica, that are really common. And Robusta is like really bitter. It's really potent. It's kind mm -hmm. of greeny. Arabica is like the delicious full body flavor that, you know, when you're somebody who drinks a lot of coffee and likes the experience of it, Cheers. you have Arabica. <laughs> ah, absolutely. Right? So, so it's totally unthinkable for you to use Robusta beans. Um, however, like so many of the people we spoke to, he was more obsessed with his own context than some best practice. And he noticed his customers were truck drivers and construction workers and entrepreneurs who wanted coffee as a transaction. They didn't care about the experience. They didn't want this artisanal vibe. They wanted not just energy, but the ability to work incredibly hard. And so Mike went on this journey and we tell it in the episode of like self-discovery, of discovery with his customers to create the world's strongest coffee they won a, a Super Bowl ad on TV. Mm -hmm. and, and above all, it didn't come from some like crazy thing or huge investment. It came from him very simply observing his audience, very simply understanding his own interest in coffee. He liked Robusta as well. Hmm. And, and kind of like capitalizing that. He asked the right questions, I guess, of his own environment versus obsess over some expert's answers. And, and things took off for him. And now, I mean, you've had it before. Describe the branding. Like, what are some of the words you would use to describe the branding? Um, bold colors, black bag. Uh, I mean, just striking strong and masculine. And, and I mean, 
it's it's it's, it's almost like uh, warfare. I I want to I want to yeah. yeah. take just take it on and and it's, it makes you kind of proud actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's an identity. It's skull and crossbones, yeah, yeah, and red yeah. and black, and and you know funny or sarcastic or aggressive little quips on Instagram, and yep. people get tattoos of the logo, and and they have hundreds of thousands of fans on social media. Like people are obsessed with this brand. They yeah. they've done the impossible in our world, which is. They've they've held people's attention. They've gotten depth, not breath, not mm-hmm. reach. That's the easy part. Get in front of somebody. They've gotten resonance, and uh, hmm. and they turned the business around and built this multi million dollar, you know, well on their way to becoming a behemoth. And if you look around the coffee landscape, they are totally the exception from the rules. Mm-hmm. And it has nothing to do with being a rebel, even though their brand is the rebel brand. Sure. Um, it has nothing to do with over-investing in something or technology or any sort of mystical muse that visited them. It has everything to do with the fact that they trusted their intuition over some guru that wrote a great book. And, uh, and your intuition is just your ability to find knowledge from within your scenario. And, and so that's where they focused and they took off. It's a great, great story. So that, that one's my favorite. Sweet. No, that's awesome. And it de- demonstrates the, the disruptor uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, concept. Um, but you're absolutely right. Is, is, you know, it's a great story. But my gosh, that is such an intake for a for a uh, content uh, writer, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you're writing content, and that's a good deal of insight into uh, not a. I mean, you can certainly make many different versions of that story. Sure. I mean, you go into the concentric circles here, and, <laughs> and literally, that's it's really at the core. It's the why of the Simon Sinek's why why they're doing what they're doing, and. Right. Uh, not the, not the name drop. We would love to have Simon Sinek on the show as well. But <laughs> I just love Simon Sinek. And th- you're telling why stories. Th- that's what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, first principle thinking, which is huge in the tech startup world where I come from. You know, it's reaching the first principles of something to build back up more original thinking from there. Hmm. And it only is original. It only looks crazy because the other individuals that are used to doing things similar to you, they haven't reached the insights you have you've reached the fundamental truth. You refuse to stop at the convention. You refuse to stop at the best practice trend that everyone's glomming onto. And you get down to that human fundamental layer. And now it's up to you to kind of build back up, but you build back up logically. So all of these stories, like I said, it starts seeming crazy. And my job as the host, as the producer, is to entertain, sure, make you feel, leave you feeling raw and questioning of the things you thought you knew. However, I have to do that in a story that feels logical. Because then people walk away, and this is the response I get. I have done X, Y, and Z now because I've listened to your show. Mm-hmm. It's completely different than everything I'm telling on the show. It's not my prescription that they're using. It's right. They're somehow inspired by the show, and they're applying that kind of feeling and those lessons to their work because they realized, oh, wait, doing great work isn't some kind of giant leap. It's just that you have to think differently. It's not how you act. It's not the tips and tricks. It's how you think. And so, you know, you think in a questioning state, all of a sudden you drum up your own answers. You get to those first principles. So, I mean, that's another reason that people, I think, feel passionately about the show. There's not just this empty download. I I get long emails. Um, And it's because it's like, Hmm. I'm, I think I'm trying to, to leave people raw, right? I'm not trying to give you a prescription with a nice bow on it. I'm trying to open you up to new possibilities and then let you go find the way forward. And the analogy I use is I want everybody to have their own Iron Man suit. I want to tell you what all the component pieces of the suit does. And then I don't want to tell you how to use it. <laughs> do what you will. Couldn't do Batman there. Could you? No, no. <laughs> ba- what is Batman's superpower again? <laughs> what? He's rich. Okay. He's rich. Okay. What is Tony Stark's superpower Back again? the truck up. He's rich. Yeah. They're Okay, they're both rich. Yeah. One guy decided to dress up like a bat and have cool, crazy little like gadgets and have martial arts. The other guy built himself a super suit. Dude, 21 different martial arts. The guy's a PhD in so many different diagnoses and sciences. Who, who, who is this guy? <laughs> from, from, what, from, from the Will Snow. Now, here's the trump card right here. From the Will Smith Wild Wild West movie that was so garbage, that one moment that wasn't garbage was the guy lands on the machine to fight Will Smith, and yeah. he goes like, whoa, right? He's going to fight him with karate. Ch- and then Will Smith pulls out a gun and goes, you're done, right? Iron Man beats Batman 10 out of 10 times. Get out of here. <laughs> you have no idea, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, I think I've made a terrible mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Hey, what tips would you have uh, for people who are trying to start their own podcast? 
<laughs> uh, watch a lot of Iron Man. Movies. Oh my uh, God! <laughs> and he's out. He's just out. So we were talking about podcasting, I believe. Um, okay, so uh, fundamentally, <laughs> podcasting, just like video, but certainly podcasting more so because there aren't, are no visuals. Uh, it's a linear medium. And so there's only two ways that a, a user, a listener can interact. They can hit play or they can hit stop. And so you have a very simple goal. I'm friend, trying you're right now, but you're still playing. <laughs> <laughs> you're trying to hit stop. <laughs> stop. Um, but you basically have one rule if you're going to start a new podcast, which is make sure they don't hit stop. Right. Mm -hmm. And so now you orient around the right decisions. So, you know, podcast is 99.9% is .9 host talent. I get a lot of questions. It's about how to start a podcast. They're looking for tech. They're looking for tactics. And I ask, are you any good on a microphone? Hmm. Are you a good interviewer? Have you studied interviewing? It's a skill, not just like a list of questions you repeat. Or are you a good storyteller? Are you good on a microphone? And people really don't think that. They don't understand that. And, and to me, the analogy here is like, you know, it's like that guy in your corporate basketball league who shows up with like the headband and the sleeves hmm. and the latest gear and the protein bar and the LeBron James, James shoes. He looks like a baller, right? Because he's got right. all the tech. He's got right. all the stuff. Right. And then you start playing basketball and he can't play, right? It's like, but playing basketball is what basketball is. It's like being at a microphone is what podcasting is. Being interesting to listen to is what that is. So start there, mm -hmm. get good on a microphone, right? And then keep that golden rule in mind. You have one purview, one job, get them to the end. Whether you have a hook at the beginning and mm -hmm. you bring it back at the end, you have you can use something called open loops, which is a journal, journalistic ter term to like you tease them, but don't give them the final outcome until the very end. Whether you tell a story, do post-production like I do, whatever the means is, is up to you. And there's plenty of articles to find there. But the, the underpinning, the first principle, if you will, is get them to the end. If you do that, you'll create a better show than your peers. No, absolutely. And would you? It's certainly an undervalued uh, skill. But are you seeing? Now we, we interviewed uh, David H. Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence talking about. He's actually teaching. He, he's uh, from Hollywood. He's actually teaching uh, people how to actually uh, improve their skills on camera and what type of framing they need to do and what type of lighting they need to do. And there's certainly new techniques in in audio production. I mean, there's a whole new place where people have to understand they have they've got to be able to brandish this skill because. Outside of the formatting and the imagery and what have you, you've got to be able to engage. You have to be able to have a, a, a good story. And by the way, um, and, and the fact of the matter is, is that if you're not a crime fighter to begin with, all the gadgets, all the things, you, it's just like it's just like the guy coming to the ball game with all the stuff, right? Stark's not a crime fighter. <laughs> Wayne is. He's got all the skills. <laughs> I saw it in your eye. <laughs> it was when I made eye contact. I, I was like, I was waiting. I was watching the logic tree unfold, and I'm like, this branch has a bat symbol on it. Wow. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I had to do it. I had to do. It. Hey, uh, have you tried to monetize your show? Uh, I, I have, but I think it's not what most people would assume a show does to monetize, which is sponsor or, you know, maybe some sort of like ride along host kind of like narrative style or a, um, you know, uh, what do they call it? Sponsored content yeah, style. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's, it's generating a lot of leads for my speaking. Um, it's also a great, what I would call maybe bottom of funnel tool for that. People are vetting me to come give a keynote and they check out the show. Mm -hmm. Um, the show is my sneaky advantage over a lot of speakers. I get to tell all these stories and see what works and try out ideas and, and basically rehearse before I have a speech and then I can pluck out the right stories for that audience. So it's a really nice, um, play on my speaking. Um, but then also I, I'm now starting to host and produce shows for other brands and specifically, um, you know, really interested in B2B mm -hmm. and telling more meaningful stories about work. So in the way that I'm monetizing it, it's for kind of higher ticket items, not sort of sponsorship per episode. And this, I think, lets me experiment more and learn more. Mm -hmm. And it also, I think, honors the audience a lot better because I'm only focused on them. Even if way down the line, I'm focused on sponsors, it's going to have to be in line with the journey that I'm, I'm on with these listeners because 
I mean, podcasting is nothing if not intimacy that scales. And and I can't lose that with my audience. Yeah, you don't want to have a bunch of NASCAR symbols uh, and, yeah. and advertising. <laughs> yeah, on and this them. episode yeah, is right. brought to you by HelloFresh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Blue Apron. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing, too, is I think there's going to be a uh, – a reckoning in the podcast space when more data gets released from Apple or all these other service providers, because mm. what do you do? It's just like a TV ad, you know, you skip because you have the control or you pull up an article on your phone or open Twitter for the ad reads. Like maybe it's going into your ears, like the audio of a mm -hmm. TV spot, but you're not absorbing it. You're not mm -hmm. remembering it. So I think these, these pre and mid and post role ads right, right. aren't long for this world. And I also think the brand's that that are promoting them are kind of ruining the industry for the rest of us because they have these inflated fake numbers of 50,000 downloads, which they got once, and they're telling you they get without actually showing you they get it. So there's a lot of things <laughs> swirling in the podcasting world. Again, the wave's going to crash. And I think the people that come back are going to be the hucksters, going to be the liars, going to be the ones that are jamming ads down your throat. The right. people that remain, I think, are the ones that honor the audience the most. I, I would agree with that completely. Um, hey, uh, Changing up real quick, uh, uh, content marketing world. Mm -hmm. uh, congrats on uh, being the opening keynote uh, Thank you. for this year's content marketing. For those of us who uh, haven't been to the show, can you actually talk about, about uh, how you won this year's keynote? Yeah. So every year, Content Marketing World, uh, you know, one of my favorite events in the industry, uh, it feels like homecoming because people get what you do if you're in that industry. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 4,000 strong each year. Um, every year, they rate the speakers, the audience, through the app and through forms offline. Um, and uh, I was the number one rated audience uh, speaker in 2016. I was incredibly blown away by that fact. Um, a lot of the bribes I gave out seemed to work, I think. Um <laughs> Uh, that's by what, the way, we'll that's be what, taking that's donations. What, that's what Tony Stark would do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, See, that wasn't even like, there was no connection. That was just a guy. I told you, Jay. Get out of here. So, so to the three people and my mom still watching, um, what I was, the rest of the story is that um, I got to open the, uh, the the event this year on the, uh, the main stage. So I was just incredibly uh, happy about that, obviously, but it was also just such a cool experience. And there's no group better than the group in that room. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it was it was a good time early September. And then, uh, you know, so if you haven't been, let's hang out next year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, you, how was uh, Joseph Gordon Levitt? Uh, mm. He was great. I think the best part of it, though, for me as a podcaster that does scripted work, is if you were sitting in the front rows, as I was during that talk that he gave, the actor Joseph Gordon Levitt was there. Uh, later in the, the event, he gave a keynote same stage. And you look down or look to the left or right, and there's little screens. He had everything scripted out, wow. like every pause, every um and uh in his kind of opening remarks before his fireside chat interview. Um, but it didn't play like that. Right. Like he'd thought about it to the point where he had every little pause planned out. And it, obviously he's an actor, but did not play like it was scripted. And that we can learn a lot from that. You Absolutely. know, it's, you got to have a plan. And a lot of us just turn on the microphone and don't have a plan. You guys have a plan. You know, Tony Stark has a plan. <laughs> uh, all right, New Yorkie. I mean, we're, we're about to go fisticuffs here. Sorry, what, what's that? No, oh, it's not wow. important. No, it's, it's a Batman fan. I can talk. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's not important. <coughs> oh, yeah. No, he's delusional. That's the word. Oh, yeah. my <laughs> gosh. Mm. <sighs> I'm exhausted here. What is happening? That's, that's funny. <laughs> I have no stake in the game. I enjoy all of them. <laughs> So you're over there like Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> Iron Hawkeye. Even uh, better. Oh, <laughs> and Jim's a Green Lantern fan, so I don't know what the hell's going on with him. Deadpool. <laughs> Deadpool. Deadpool. <laughs> okay, so hey, so where should marketers start whenever they want to stop being average? Uh, I think so the shift is Stop obsessing over everybody's answers for you uh -huh. and start asking the right questions of the stuff right in front of your face, right? Like even the best practice of the biggest guru in the world should have an implied line of questioning at the end of that article, which is, well, what do you think? Well, what works for you, right? I think what happens is when we, when we question all the conventional thinking out there, using the details of our own context, we start making better decisions faster. And so, you know, for the show's journey, we tell a lot of stories. I'm also trying to rip out like, what are, what's a good question to ask to think or act like they did, right? And so we're looking at questions that you can ask about yourself, 
questions you can ask about your customer, and then questions you can ask about your resources to make that work happen. Um, and we've come up with a framework. We've come up with a little like, you know, graphic with a bunch of questions on it that you can use as like a shield, as a, you know, as a, let's say an iron suit that you can wear to be more powerful as a belt of tools. I'll give you one as a belt of tools that you can use to make sense of all the stuff out there. Right. So like, I honestly, I want people to act like investigators instead of follow the listers. There's too much of that going on. You know, it's, it's just, at it least the commodity junk work. Um, but if you root out the answers in front of you, mm -hmm. man, you can, you can do things that others think is crazy or, or seems innovative. And all you know is the reality of your customer is X, not Y, you know? So that, that's the, that's the punch there. It's great work. Isn't done by following some best practice. Mm -hmm. They're never, they never end up getting you the best result. They get you fine average copycat mm -hmm. results. And if they work for others, but not us, the key add the us. I dig it. Yeah, I, I, and th this goes right into my one of my final questions here. What bugs you about the industry that you're in right now? Mm. I mean, we uh, covered a lot. This is the whole episode, right? We got another hour's worth of discussing yeah. this. Yeah. The <laughs> title of my the blog. Hounds. <laughs> the name of my blog is Sorry for Marketing. So there's a lot I could say on this topic. <laughs> so I, I just, it's gonna look. Let's let's get really sappy for a minute here. I I fundamental fundamentally believe that people do have within them and their teams what it takes to do great work. And, and they keep looking externally for the answers. They're looking for some book or guru or, or podcast. And, you know, it's, it's not going to happen. It's not going to save you. The next best practice or trend isn't going to do it. You are. If you're going to do anything better than average, it's going to be up to you. Um, you know, and I think the word exceptional is the one I use because if you're going to do exceptional work, you're going to be the exception from all that other stuff. And, and I think the good news is every individual is the bad news is we don't trust that. You know, we don't go searching for answers based on the uniqueness of our team. Like, what could we do that's different than others because we have this makeup of people doing the work? We don't go searching for answers by talking to our customers. We just look for what the other guy's doing and we try to put it on repeat and make tiny changes to it. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a damn shame because I feel like, you know, you get, you get one life. You get to do this once and you spend so much of your time at work. You know, why not do the best you could possibly do? And I think the best you can possibly do is never going to look like what the other guy out there or woman out there is telling you to do. Very good. Well said. Um, conversely, what excites you about the industry right now? I mean, I love it's a blank canvas, right? Like that's that what we talked about before with all these different shows. Um, you know, I think the the reason I'm excited about this shift, don't listen to the, the gatekeepers essentially is who I'm railing against hmm. because they don't have the power they used to have. Right. They, you know, the, I can publish an article without going through an editor with if, if you're from print like I was, mm -hmm. that's revolutionary. And, and we, I think, forgot that that's actually amazing. Um, I can create a show and mimic anything I want. Why would I mimic the B2B show I'm competing with or, you know, the best brand show? I should I should mimic the best damn show I admire possible. Um, so that's what excites me is we're living through this time where, you know, the the idea does matter. You know, you got to execute it, but, but if you can come up with an idea that's unique to you, um, it matters because no one else is going to be able to do that. And, uh, you know, so at the end of the day, we're living through this like blank canvas era that the internet is creating. And the more you can embrace that and, and invent instead of try to fall back on a precedent or a case study or a repeat tactic, I think the further you go, both in results and the fulfillment you have in your career. So that's what I'm excited about today. What about tomorrow? I'll, I'll let you know. Okay. Yeah, I'll let you. Know. <laughs> <laughs> I see. I've lost the credibility here, right? Like I, that, I, that, you're that digging yourself you out were, of you a You asked hole. me what about tomorrow, but yeah, you, yeah. you were thinking Batman is better. That's what you were thinking for the most part, right? Yeah. Uh, and 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 you know, I, I just I now have a Tony Stark picture, you know, a, a helmet floating around. We're gonna actually throw, throw that in in post. Just uh, put okay. a, put an <laughs> Iron Man <laughs> face on Jay. That's so, what I want to see. So, just so people understand, Batman is awesome because he has the tool belt, the <clears throat> the plane, the mm -hmm, car, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the wealth. So and, Iron Man decided, and I'm, the discipline and the skills, bar none. And he's also the most vulnerable. All those superheroes with their superpowers, right? This guy is on the streets making it happen. He could be killed at any moment in time. It's not the nipples. 
God. That is, I'm not going to top that. That's the best part of the show. Thank you for tuning in. This is the edge, edge of the Marvel comic universe. <laughs> My name is Tony Stark. I appreciate you flying with us today. With many options on Facebook Live. Wow. Okay. So, is there anything that we can promote for you besides Marvel? I want to hear about the NCAA thing real quick. Oh, all right. All you right. skipped over the fun fact. How are you technically a professional basketball player? Oh, my fun fact. I am So in the eyes of the NCAA, I am a professional basketball player. There was a tournament for money through like to raise money for charity, but you got a little bit of uh, skin in the mm. game. You got like 100 bucks for weekend cash in college. Um, and I played in this basketball tournament at my school. And we had to start on our roster. We had a member of the team, Division three school. So it wasn't a huge deal. And he had to leave because if he had won the tournament, he would have yeah. been paid for playing basketball. Right. So I've been paid for playing collegiate basketball. So I am now technically a go. professional basketball player. There you um, go. Yeah. So I, I'm accepting all sponsorships. <laughs> uh, you know, I big baller I, brand. I, yeah, totally big. <laughs> no, anything but that. <laughs> I'd say their headquarters is right over here, so we can we can uh, we can put in a good word to get that change if you wanted. But <laughs> absolutely. I don't have the hair to be a big baller yeah. brand spokesperson. <laughs> All right, so you certainly want to check out, to all of our listeners and, uh, in our audience and, and watchers, you go check out the podcast, unthinkable.fm. Uh, it's a fantastic, and, and uh, you've got a whole season coming up of, of different stories. When, when does that get launched? Uh, two weeks from now. So right around Thanksgiving, we're going to release kind of binge mode style. We're going to release all the episodes right nice. away. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I'm, ha I'm, I'm having to restrain my – are you a big Stranger Things fan? Uh, the season one was great. I've heard mixed things about season two. I haven't started yet. Oh, we were, we're, we're I mean, this whole binge mentality. I tell you what, I'm, 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 I'm a bit keyed off on that because there's so much and you can burn through it so quick. Yeah. And then it's over. It yeah. is. And then you got to wait a year. I know. <laughs> yeah. What is, yeah. Find, find another one. <laughs> All right. So uh, Jay, how can people actually uh, track you down and, and assault you with, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Batman missiles? <laughs> Uh, Batman has missiles now. Interesting. Oh, uh, not nipples, Iron Man missiles. <laughs> so uh, I'm, all, I'm all over the intertubes. And honestly, I have nothing to promote because if you watched all the way through to this and you still don't want to check me out, I'm not going to ask you to go <laughs> check me out. So, uh, but thank you if you have paid attention to this rambling uh, interview and an amazing <laughs> debate of Marvel <laughs> comics. Uh, oh, we got know. more. We got more. We could go a whole oh other God. hour. Really? Yes, we it. could, but you know, well, we can't. <laughs> All right. Well, Jay, it's been a pleasure. Uh, fanta Likewise. Fantastic uh, podcast. We certainly are in all what you're doing, and 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 and, and 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 fight the good fight, man, because you're you're doing you're you're demonstrating how to be authentic regularly and really showcasing a lot of stories that maybe they don't know how to tell their own story, but you're certainly uh, uh, giving uh, giving that. Uh, yeah, insight into uh, where these individuals and these companies and these organizations are are striving to uh, do the best that they possibly can. So uh, go to sorryformarketing.com as well. Want to make sure that our listeners and audio uh, and our watchers all check out. You'll see all the links and on the show notes. Um, anything final for our guests or our audience uh, today? No, show show these if you're watching and listening now, uh, show these hosts some love because it's hard to put on a show <laughs> like these guys put on. And let me tell you, they, they, they do a good job. So Thank give the you. give the host some love. I appreciate it. I'm scarred and chafed from this one. <laughs> <laughs> I was, that was my ointment. I was trying to soothe it over a little bit. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So uh, thank you to all of our uh, who are listening to Edge of the Web Radio. Special thank you to our colleagues at Site Strategics as well as uh, our guest, uh, Jay Acunzo. And uh, make sure that, that you see all the must-see videos and more of the insider information over at edgeofthewebradio.com. That's edgeofthewebradio.com. We'll talk to you next week. Who are we talking to? Tom Fishburn, the marketoonist, oh, talking about cartoons awesome. and your content marketing. Sweet. Love it. He's got a new book coming out. so Maybe he'll yeah. draw me a Batman art, uh, cartoon. Maybe. <laughs> I, I, I need reparation here. I really do. <laughs> All right. Hey, we'll talk to you next week. Do not be a piece of cyber driftwood. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.